when we started out, the first store was called Dominic's and uh, owned by a guy by the name of Dominic Tavardi. And we uh, bought this store from Dominic, uh, and Dominic gave us permission to use the name. After a couple of years, uh, and uh, my store in Ypsilanti became uh, probably the busiest pizzeria in the whole state of Michigan, I got a call from Dominic one day, and he said, you can't use my name anymore. And so it was kind of a panic. We were thinking about different names to call it. And one day, a driver came in from a delivery, and he shouts out, I got a new name, Domino's. I says, that's great. That's a great name. I had just joined the board of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and he was proposed as a new board member. That was quite an impression, because when he was traveling then, he would come in by his own plane to the local airport, and then by helicopter to the Franciscan campus, and accompanied by a security guard. The Tigers had just won the World Series, first year he owned them. So and he, he was quite a known, well-known person. You know, I was a special case. I, I don't think too many people got obsessed with all the toys as I did. It was sort of a fast train heading for a train wreck, and I got off the train. Maybe just in time, I don't know. I uh, was the first one to take a delivery seriously and basically uh, developed a whole industry, um, pizza delivery. And at one point in the uh, late 80s, we had 54% of all the pizzas delivered in the United States. At that time, when I put the company up for sale, I read a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And I had a chapter in there on pride. And I always uh, knew that I had a lot of pride. I mean, the biggest sin I confessed, I went to confession over the years, is that I was too obsessed with impressing people. And I knew that was something I always had to battle. I don't know whether it was because I was brought up so poor or what. Um, and that chapter in that book just hit me right between the eyes. And he basically was telling me that the reason you work so hard and you try to accomplish all you had was to have more, not just more, but more than other people. And uh, that hit me right between the eyes, and I couldn't sleep that night. You get the understanding that he grew up in an orphanage, and, and that begins to become very clear in his life, that not only was he at the top of his game at one point, but in his giving away his money, he he basically is happy without anything. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing because most people, if they have a lot of money and um, they grew up poor, they're afraid of that uh, experience again. But in his case, when he had that conversion that he had, he really, really believed that the most important thing was the eternal and it made such a difference in his life. After reading the C.S. Lewis's the book, I, uh, I decided that I was going to give up all the toys, and I, I took what I call them, the millionaire's spot of poverty. I mean, we were always taught that pride is the basis of all other sins. After reading C.S. Lewis, I thought that I must be the biggest sinner in the world because I don't know anybody has more, more pride than I do. I mean, that was really a sobering uh, <laughs> thought. You know, it's not like I'm, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm uh, totally recovered from it yet. <laughs> At first, it was difficult to uh, understand exactly how deep that change in him was. But I have witnessed it now very close up over the past 10 years and there's no doubt in my mind that it's extremely genuine and he has a an ability to uh, give up the perquisites of wealth that I've seen few other people have and I wanted my money to go where it did the most good and uh, save the most souls and I uh, very easily was able to narrow that down to education and I narrowed the education down to higher education and that's why we're doing what we're doing here. And very few people uh, have the ability, the wherewithal, to start a university. So I thought it was kind of an obligation, a 
call in. It's something I had to do. A lot of people say they want to die broke, but I don't see many people putting themselves in a position where they actually are going to die broke, where they take on commitments that are going to exhaust their resources. And Tom's done that, and he's, you look around this town, it's like he's already given away the majority, and he's fully committed, and he's put himself in a, really in an irreversible position of doing just that. And it's not because he doesn't like money or doesn't like the things that money can buy or he's trying to give his way into heaven. Tom wants to go to heaven and bring as many people with him by using his money to build the kingdom. Yeah, I didn't mention I live in the dorm. But... My secretary calls him myself. Tom's approach to generosity is really interesting because he sort of leads the way, but there's room for as many people who would like to join him to participate. And there's not only room, that, but they're invited. That's one of the things that drew me into this, that there was room for me to participate yeah. in a really substantive way and to bring my gifts into this great vision. And um, I think that's one of the reasons he's attracted so many people giving their time, their treasure into this whole endeavor. Right now, my life is so right for the way God made me. I believe I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Uh, and I, I feel so privileged that he gave me the, the wisdom to see it.